On a crisp Friday morning in 1703, Lemuel Gulliver spotted in the distance the enormous metropolis of Lorbulgerd, northwest of what we know today as California. For ten weeks, he had been traveling with an affectionate nine-year-old girl he called Little Nurse, or Glumdunklich in her language. On the road, he spent hours studying the little girl's primer, which included, as primers do, the religious text of her people, in order to learn their language. During the 18th century, it was common for the British to use the Bible to teach English. Now Gulliver was being instructed in the language of these people using their religious text. Quite the reversal. The other difference, of course, was that his tutor was around 40 feet tall. Which, for her age, she was quite short. I use this story from Jonathan Swift to illustrate a prevailing notion at the time also exemplified by Arthur Dobbs, Swift's classmate at Trinity College, Dublin. Dobbs wrote a pamphlet during his tenure as governor of North Carolina that local Indians should be, quote, civilized, converted, and instructed in the arts, science, language, and the manners of Great Britain, unquote. According to Caroline Robbins, writing of Dobbs' thinking, Christians should practice what they preach. Indians ought not be despised by them. In many ways, the customs of the Indians were more in accord with the law of nature than those of their conquerors. For both Swift and Dobbs, they saw the Americas as a land of plenty. For Swift's Gulliver, the Americas were a giant panorama of potential. But Swift was quick to admit his fictional character was a stranger there and unaware of their odd customs. Nevertheless, he wrote Gulliver as a man who sought to learn the language cultural traditions and temper himself over the two years he lived there with the wisdom of the literally giant land. For Dobbs, he saw the only way for the colonies to succeed and grow would be to grow together with the Indians, for the two peoples to become one. As Dobbs wrote, quote, As the soul animating the natural body makes all the members of it useful to each other in subservience to its maintenance and the more comfortable subsistence, so trade in the body politic makes the several parts of it contribute to the well-being of the whole, and also to the more comfortable and agreeable living of every member of the community. The realities of the trans-oceanic imperium weighed heavily on the minds of the British, whether they lived at home or abroad in the colonies. As Edmund Burke so eloquently stated, quote, 3,000 miles of ocean lie between us and them, no contrivance can prevent the effect of this distance in weakening government. Seas roll and months pass between the order and the execution, and the want of a speedy explanation of a single point is enough to defeat a whole system. Other challenges prevailed in the colonies, such as the environment. As Forrest MacDonald stated, New Hampshire was nearly in a state of nature. Its rugged, heavily wooden terrain and severe winters isolated most of its citizens from one another and bred an intense localism, loyalty to a town or a village or a valley rather than to the state and nation. Furthermore, large states in the new American nation demanded they receive more rights than smaller states. As George Reed stated, the great states have appropriated to themselves. And then, if you please, proportion the representation, and we shall not be jealous of one another. These examples illustrate three nation-building problems that exist as the scale of civilization increases. Firstly, the integration of rural and urban populations into what Michael Garrison describes as con-urban societies is necessary in city and community planning for maximum cultural productivity. Secondly, that governance over large spaces must be connected with convenient routes that create trade opportunities through what Francisco Estrada Belli has described as hegemonic network hubs. And thirdly, in a large republic with locales far away from those hubs, societies should adopt both an equal amount of representation within the leading representative body but also these micro-societies need to adopt what Michael Ledbetter calls autocatalytic urban ecosystems in order to maintain sustainability in environments normally hostile to habitation. 
While Garrison, Estrada Belli, and Ledbetter are mostly concerned with the analysis of pre-Columbian American society mechanisms, their insights are surprisingly in line with British, American colonial, and post-revolutionary realities. And these principles continue to be important today when addressing problems of human scale across expanding territories. As Jane Jacobs explains, big cities and countrysides can get along well together. Big cities need real countryside close by. And countryside, from man's point of view, needs big cities with all their diverse opportunities and productivity so human beings can be in a position to appreciate the rest of the natural world instead of to curse it. In other words, according to Jacobs, planning for human habitation requires a careful balancing of utility, community needs, human needs, and environmental appreciation.